Amen. Malachi chapter 2, uh, we left off about verse 10. What God is saying through Malachi to the people is that you're, you're dishonoring me. You're not honoring me as you should, even though you are giving the sacrifices, even though you are going through the motions, you're not doing what you ought to be doing in doing so. And God is saying, basically, I reject it. I will not accept what you're doing. And they also had some problems with uh, their relationships. And we're going to see that in uh, Malachi chapter 2. And we're going to see how that relationships with one another, especially our spouse, will affect our relationship with God. Kind of illustrate it like this. You have your horizontal relationship, and then you have your vertical relationship. These are your relationships with people here upon the earth, and this is your relationship with God. If you're not treating the people here upon the earth, you not have a right relationship with God. A right relationship with God means that you're going to treat your horizontal relationships in a manner that He has taught in His Word. So you just can't have this in place without having this in place. And we're going to see this in just a moment in Malachi chapter 2. Beginning in verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do you deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? You're dealing treacherously with one another. To deal treacherously means you're not acting towards one another as you ought. To be treacherous means to be dishonoring. Uh, Not treating those around you as you should. He says, when you do that, you are profaning the covenant of your fathers. He says in verse 11, Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. He has married the daughter of a foreign god. Now part of their problems was they were marrying contrary to God's will. And that was dealing treacherously um, as well. Verse 12, May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob, and the man who does this, be, the man who does this being awake and aware, yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. Verse 12, we talked about at the very end of class, being awake and aware means you know exactly what you're doing, and you do it anyway. He says, you're going to be cut off from the tents of Jacob. In other words, I'm not going to accept what you're doing because you, when we use the expression, you went into this situation with your eyes wide open. You knew what you were doing. You knew it was not right. Yet, verse 12, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. So here again, if you, know, you, you look at this concept, not only were they dealing treacherously with one another in their horizontal relationships they were they thought they could do this and be right with God and he's saying no if you're not if you're not doing what you should be doing our relationship is not right and so that that's something that has to be we'll, we'll look at a few verses in just a moment especially when it comes to marriage uh, that deals with that Verse 13, this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so He does not regard the offering anymore, uh, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion 
and your wife by covenant. The verse 13 here is dealing with some of the problems that's causing their, their sacrifice to be unacceptable to God. Verse 13 says, You come weeping and crying before the altar. You cover the altar of the Lord with weeping, tears, weeping, and crying. That indicates the emotional nature by which they come before God. And, and there's nothing wrong with being emotional in worship as long as it's kept in check, as long as it's not out of control. It, there's nothing wrong with shedding a tear if you're singing a song about God and about Christ and what He's done. Shedding a tear... Uh, in the Lord's Supper and thinking about His death and His sacrifice, that's fine. However, that's not a substitute for living as you ought and treating, in this context here, your spouse as you should. There's a lot of people this very morning who are in worship services at this very hour who are just boo-hooing. They got the tears just flowing. It's very much emotional. Yet they will go back to living the way they lived before. They're, they're, as it were, coming before the Lord, covering the altar of the Lord on Sunday morning with tears. Yet they're not living as they should. That's emotionalism. That's not genuine repentance. That's not genuine change of life. And he says, you know, he's, he's, he's bringing these charges. Here's what you're doing. Here's their response. What do you mean? Then he says, well, here's, here's the problem. So he's responding to them when he says in verse 14, when they say, for what reason? Why won't you regard our offering anymore? Remember, they asked that in chapter 1. Why won't you re- regard our offering? Well, here's the reason. You're bringing the sick the lame, the blind. That's the reason. Now he's saying, here's another thing. I don't regard your offering anymore. They say, for what reason? He says, because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth. You're not treating your spouse as you ought. Now this gets down to the closest person that we should be uh, closest to on earth, our spouse. And what is, what is uh, he saying here? He's saying, again, if these relationships are not what they ought to be, these horizontal earthly relationships, then this vertical relationship cannot be what it should be. The New Testament says something about that. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 7. 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. Husbands likewise dwell with them, talking about your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Did you notice that last part? That your prayers may not be hindered. What is Peter saying here? What will hinder your prayers? Mistreating your wife. Or vice versa, the wife mistreating the husband. That would be, in principle, applied to both. So, wait a minute. You're telling me I can't just go to church and have a relationship with God and disregard all this you mean I can't have a right relationship with God unless I treat the others the way I should that's exactly what the Bible says but how many people do that <clears throat> how many people how many husbands are very unloving uncaring disrespectful to their wives treat their wives with contempt and yet they'll come to church on Sunday and think they have a right relationship with God How many wives do that to their husbands? Disrespect him. Treat him with contempt. And they don't treat him as they ought. But then they come here on Sunday and think they have a right relationship with God. See, it doesn't work that way. 
It doesn't work that way. So what Malachi is saying in Malachi chapter 2 has very much a, an application to us. If I mistreat my wife and not treat her as I should as a husband, don't love her as I should, and I, I speak to her in, a, in an unloving, unkind way, that will hinder my relationship with God. It doesn't matter how many sermons I preach. It doesn't matter how many people I convert. It doesn't matter how many speaking engagements I might have. I'm not right with God. So there, this is important for us to, to understand. And... Um, one time I was trying to counsel with a woman who had a really bad relationship with her husband. And really, he wasn't perfect, but she, she was really the one that was causing the problems in the relationship. And I tried to get across to her, you can't, you can't go to church on Sunday and think you're right with God just because you go to church on Sunday treating your husband the way you treat him. And I don't know if I ever got it across to her. But she, she thought, you know, she could go to church and, 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 and be righteous in her own mind and, and then treat her, her, her husband very contemptly, very wickedly, very unkindly. And that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Now, it might work in her world. In her mind, she's got it figured out. She's got it compartmentalized. Okay, I got church here and I got... This husband over here, I can't stand. But I got church here. It doesn't work that way. Because true Christianity is not compartmentalized. True Christianity affects every facet of your life. How you treat one another, how you work at work, how you vote, how you conduct yourself as a citizen, how, what you choose for entertainment. True Christianity affects all of that because it permeates every facet of who we are. So there's no compartmentalizing it in our minds, or shouldn't be. I'm trying to find the passage, and if you, can, if you know it right quick, uh, it's in 1 John where it says... Um, if you love God, how can you love God whom you've seen, but you don't love and love and hate your brother or something of that nature? If you can help me find that, that would be great. I didn't write it down. Uh, let's see. Four twenty. That's it. Thank you. I should have wrote that down. Thank you. 1 John 4.20 If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, this is exactly what Malachi is talking about. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? That's, that's exactly what Malachi is talking about. Talking about how... You're dealing treacherously with your wife, treating your spouse poorly, not, not being the husband you ought to be, or in principle, not being the wife you ought to be. But the whole time say, I love God. I love God. Well, John says, no, you don't. You're a liar. That's just words. You're lying. Because if you don't love your brother, and of course... This love here would include your love for your spouse. If you don't love your spouse whom you've seen, how can you love God whom you've not seen? So there's that concept of, of treating others with love, treating others with respect, treating others with honor, and especially the closest one to you, your spouse your wife, your husband. Verse 21 says, And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So there, there has to be that, if you're going to love God, vertical relationship, you've got to love your brother also. Horizontal relationship. 
And so that is a very important verse, 1 John chapter 5, verse 20 and 21, that goes along with Malachi chapter 2 and verse 14. When Jesus was asked uh, in uh, the gospel accounts, uh, which was the greatest commandment? He said, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He says, you also love your neighbor as yourself. So you love God supremely. Love Him supremely. And your neighbor as yourself. Any questions or comments about that? Any discussion about that? Right. Right. Very, very hypocritical. They, they have a very hateful attitude, but, but they claim to love God. Well, that, that doesn't work biblically. Someone ought to, I mean, everyone who observes you ought to recognize, recognize by how you treat your neighbor, how you treat your friends, your loved ones, your enemies. Love your enemies. They ought to recognize by those relationships that you do have a relationship with God. It's hard-pressed to convince someone you have a right relationship with God when your horizontal relationships are not what they ought to be. When you're full of hate and envy and bitterness and revenge and jealousy and all those things. Uh, you, you can't convince someone that you've got a right relationship with God, especially biblically. <clears throat> that can't happen. So, Malachi 2 and verse 13, he says, You're sacrificing to me, but I'm not going to accept it. Uh, I, no, I won't receive the goodwill from your hands. I'm not going to accept it. Why? Verse 14, because... You are dealing treacherously with your wife. You're not treating her as you ought. You're dealing with her in a, in a manner that is not loving, not kind. So, you know, there is no uh, way that a person can, can, can be out of harmony with their spouse and be right with God in the sense of... Uh, uh, them being the problem. I know there are certain situations that cannot be resolved. You've got to do your best to be the best person you can be, whether it be a husband or a wife. And, of course, your spouse has a choice as well. And so um, here we see that the, the, uh, the wife there, if you look at the latter part of verse 14, your wife is a wife by covenant. Your wife by covenant. What is a covenant? Promise, bond. Contract. That would, that would be a way of describing it. Agreement. You know, I was asked, do you take Jennifer to be your wife? Yes. Does she take you to be your husband? Yes. That's an agreement, bond, contract, covenant, and marriage. There is a covenant in marriage. In verse 15, he talks further about that. Malachi 2 and verse 15. 
But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. So we see here uh, this concept of, of treating one uh, as you should. It's a covenant that is made before God. Covenant that is made before God. In a marriage you have God, you have a husband, and you have a wife. The husband, the wife, and God are in covenant relationship. They're bound together for life. The Bible says in the New Testament with only one exception, that's fornication. And so you have that covenant there. A husband, a wife, before God. And he says in verse 16, For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. So some of the relationships were getting bad and winding up in a divorce. So that's, that, of course, is dealing treacherously with your spouse. And in Deuteronomy chapter 24, we have the, the, the law that God gave through Moses as to why he would permit a divorce under the law of Moses. Of course, in the New Testament, we have only uh, one reason for divorce that allows for a remarriage. And that's in Matthew 19. In verse 9, Jesus says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So the only reason that God gives is for that exception, sexual immorality, fornication. But God hates divorce. He hates it because the reason is it covers one's garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. The covering of a garment was a phrase that indicated marriage in the Old Testament. In the book of Ruth, there was that concept of covering with a garment. In uh, Ezekiel chapter 16, when God talks about marrying Israel, He says, I covered you with my garment. When a divorce takes place, it it covers one's garments with violence. What usually happens in divorce? There's bitterness. There's arguments. There's violence. Sometimes physical. Almost certainly verbal. So it's, it's nothing good comes of it. Even when there's a scriptural reason for it to happen... It involves sin on on at least one of the spouse's part. So it's a, it's a bad thing. That's why there's such a severe penalty uh, for violating that sacred covenant of marriage that you find in Matthew chapter 19. Only one reason for the allowance of divorce and remarriage. Because a husband and wife relationship is something very special. It's the first institution that God created after He created mankind. So it goes all the way back to the origin of humanity. Marriage does. In Genesis chapter 2. So divorce, of course, is a problem in our society. And it causes uh, so much, so many things to just go wrong. Therefore, he says, therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. There are a lot of marriages that have put the brakes on and say, look, we need to work this out. 
It needs to be worked out according to God's will before they go down and uh, engage in the divorcing process. And uh, that is what God wants. That is what God wants for uh, those who are married. God created marriage, and He wants that marriage to be blessed. Look at verse 15. What is an, the purpose of marriage? Verse 15, He says, having a remnant of the Spirit. And why? God seeks godly offspring. Godly offspring. So marriages that not only stick together, but are treating one another as they should, the the husband and wife, it makes for an environment in which the children can grow up in a godly household. So God seeks godly offspring, children to be produced in uh, the uh, covenant of marriage. Divorce causes the, the problem of, of people, uh, children, not having a stable environment. And it causes instability. It causes resentment. It causes the children to have guilt. It causes uh, the, the children to have all kinds of, uh, of problems. And so the stability of a good marriage in which the husband and wife is treating one another in love, as they should, makes it for the children to grow up in a godly situation. That goes back to the concept of you can't worship or can't sacrifice as a substitute for being the people that you should be. And then put it in modern day terminology and phraseology, you can't go to church to make up for your misbehavior all week long. Can't do that. It's not going to erase how you're dealing with one another. So that goes back to your horizontal relationships have have to be right if your vertical relationship with God is going to be correct. And in context, the most important one of all is your spouse. That's the relationship that should be the strongest and you should never deal treacherously with them. Look at verse 14, no, excuse me, Um, verse 17. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, In what way have we wearied Him? In that you say, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and He delights in them. Or, where is the God of justice? So here here is uh, some of the things that they were saying. And he says, This wearies the Lord. And again, he's saying, you've wearied the Lord. Their response is, in what way have we wearied the Lord? How how have we wearied the Lord? And then God responds, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. That's what they say. And he delights in them. Do we have that in our society? What's, what is that in our society? Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. Once they're always saved, people can live how they want. It's, it's okay to be gay, as the phrase goes. I just, Robert put it. <laughs> but that, that's the, the attitude. It, it's okay. It's okay to be that way. Um, do what? Love and tolerate. Uh, in fact, you're, you're, you're the bad guy. You are the, you are the prejudiced bigot if you say two men can't get married. You know, that, that's, that's how people view it. You, you're intolerant. You're a right-wing radical. In fact, you're dangerous, they'll say. You're dangerous to this nation if you think 
that only men and women could get married. Yeah, because their God is a God of love. They say. Yeah, it's it's right. They recognize that it is uh, something to go by. That's why they would call it a schedule of the Bible, but yet they don't go by the Bible. Yeah, it, it that that's exactly right. <laughs> exactly. Well, a, a footnote to go along with this, and uh, we'll end class on on this because this is the last verse of chapter 2 and um, they still got about 10 minutes back there but I went over preaching uh, Isaiah 5 and verse 20 goes along with Malachi two seventeen. woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter you call evil good and good evil and and if you are if you're against abortion, what do they say nowadays? You're waging war on women. You you're telling a woman what she can do with her body. You're I mean you're just the bad guy if you say you shouldn't kill a human being in the womb. You're 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 the bad guy, and um, the problem with that is. That which is growing in the womb is not her body. It's a totally separate entity. We'll talk about that tonight as we talk about one of the critical issues. Exactly. You're right. I mean, that's exactly right. The, 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 the innocent blood that's on their hands is going to... Uh, God is going to pour out His wrath on that. And that, that's, that's why it's a concern for this nation to take steps to get that reversed. So, be studying next week, Lord willing, for Malachi chapter 3, and we'll go into that chapter in one week.